Welcome to Connect 2021-2024, connecting universities and industry through smart entrepreneurial cooperation and competitive intelligence of students in Moldova, Georgia, and Armenia. You are about to watch the module on startup types and the mentor mentee relationship building. This is part one. A startup is a company in its first stage of operations. Startups are founded by entrepreneurs who develop a product or a service, a solution for the market that solves a problem. Now, founders believe that there is demand out there for that solution of theirs. Startups generally start with high costs and limited, if no revenue at all. And this is why they look for capital from a variety of sources, ranging from angel investors to venture capitalists. But for how long a startup remains a startup? There are a few parameters that suggest that a startup cannot be a startup forever, like the ability to buy other companies. And this is not an uncommon phenomenon for startups that have got, you know, funded, developed their business and managed to mature enough and be strong enough as to be able to absorb other startups. It's also when they don't pose a high risk stake for the investors. A startup that exceeds revenues of 300 to 500 million per year is no longer a startup. Additionally, when a startup brand is broadly recognized, we can say that this is not a startup anymore, but it takes time. An unwritten perception or rule, you can say, on behalf of investors suggests that after five years, a startup is no longer a startup. Of course, some exceptions apply. The average founder typically supports that his startup has a great idea behind it. And that idea will lead to the creation of a solution that will solve a problem for the world. This is not always the case. That great idea is facing reality. And reality is very cruel. So the more reality you have to subtract from your great idea, the less of a great startup idea you have. The less reality you have to subtract means that you have a solid and viable business case and more chances to proceed successfully. Any business in its lifetime will go through a number of phases. We call them life cycle stages. And they range from product development to introduction and proceed with growth, maturity, and decline. Now, there is no preset time for these stages. What is a common denominator, though, is that in the beginning, expenses, costs overall, that begin before the startup is incorporated, begin to accumulate. Sales, on the other hand, can start at a later phase when the company is incorporated and gets its first clients, then sales start to increase. But in that period preceding the beginning of sales, a liquidity gap stemming from costs generated starts to appear and gets bigger and bigger and bigger. Somehow this liquidity gap has to be financed. And the best sources for this is the friends, family and fools, and of course business angels who can finance this. Many of those of the startups out there will die in that period that is called the value of death. Those who will successfully continue by increasing their sales, they will probably require more money to finance their expansion. This money comes from venture capital funds or other strategic alliances. Steve Blank, one of the world's most renowned gurus, has classified startups under six types. The first type is the lifestyle startup. That startup is built around the services of an independent web developer, a graphic designer, or a consultant. The main goal of the lifestyle startup is to support the, the living of its founders. Another category is a small business or an SME usually a family-owned and operated business that can grow and become very extroverted. Now, SMEs account for more than 90% of the businesses out there. Despite their big 
number though, SMEs are not the stereotype startups that usually people discuss about. Silicon Valley type startups though, are the ones that most of us have in our mind when we talk about startups. These are scalable startups that grow or expected to grow exponential at very high risk. And for that reason, they attract capital from VC funds, corporate funds and companies who would like to invest in this kind of startups. Of course, along with the risks, the expectations are proportional. Viable startups are designed to be quickly sold to other companies for amounts ranging from 5 to 50 million. And they are bought because they have developed some kind of a technology that is needed by some other entity. Large company startups can also develop their own spin-offs or subsidiaries, companies that are created to help the large company differentiate and penetrate new markets with new solutions. Last but not least, social startups are increasing, increasingly participating today and their founders try to build a solution around some kind of charitable character. The COVID-19 pandemic has brought a lot of challenges in this world. These challenges, along with climate change, have accelerated the founders and investors' interest in a variety of sectors, like the medical sector, the climate change sector, the sustainable material, or even the future of work. Today, many startups devote their efforts in developing solutions that meet world problems. Since the very beginning, technology played a very important, if not imperative role for most of the startups. Although technology and the provision of a technological solution is not a necessity to make a successful startup, technology plays a catalytic role. The journey of a, the average startup starts with a very, very limited resources. And for that reason, there is a great need to fund the journey somehow. Now, the average startup will look for some kind of financing or funding. When it comes to the last, only 0.5% of the startups who look for funding will actually get it. Another trend is the appetite for high-risk investments on behalf of investing entities. And that is a good thing because it encourages tests and new technologies. The last but not least is because there is a plethora of technological innovations out there. Innovation has become less innovative. Funding for startups is showing a steady increase over the last five years. That increase is expected to continue as more funding entities are willing to place their bets for the technological solutions that startup offers and promise to solve big problems for the world. In this quest for solutions that solve problems for the world, startups continue their quest. They look for talent, talent that will complement their team and will provide the necessary skill set and experience to complete the creation of a solution and deliver it to the world. Startups also will look for money because without it, they cannot go far. So they need to cover both product development as well as business development and operational needs. Startups also will look for all kinds of support to guide them to the market, make the right steps, select the right synergies, and of course, plan all the necessary steps until the end of the trip. Startups will go in a quest to cover these needs. They look for talent, support, money. So startup accelerators can be the destination, can be the place to look for all those as they concentrate all the firepower that can help the startup founders win their game. But are all startups acceleration material? Should the startup join an acceleration program? Are founders compatible with all the services and the mentoring they can get? Well, that depends on the program specifications and the founders' priorities. Every program has a variety, a menu of services 
that extends to participating startups. On the other hand, founders' priorities are not the same. An idea stage startup, a prototype startup, or a startup that has gone beyond the launch period have different priorities. And all those things combined need to be taken into account before a startup join an acceleration program or select which acceleration program to join. In order to help candidates answer the question if they need to join an accelerator or even pick between a, an investing or a non-investing accelerator, we are going to see an example that is based on a Silicon Valley bank module that was developed for that reason. In the case we're looking the answer if we want to join a non-investing accelerator and want to apply this module, a set of screening questions need to be answered. Each of those questions has a difficult weight. Each of those questions can be answered with a yes or a no, with a value of zero for the absolute no and a value of three for the absolute yes. That will result to a score for each one of the answers and a total score for the main question. The closer we are to three, the closer we are to yes, the closer we are to zero, the closer we are to no. In this case, with a total rating of 1.6, the answer is not very clear for that startup if it wants to if it needs to join a non-investing accelerator. As we can see, this startup with a rating a little above 1.5 cannot confidently say if it needs to join a non-investing accelerator. In a similar way, those questions applied to an investing accelerator, but with different weights, can provide different kind of answers. So that same startup, you can see here, that has a much higher rating. And in this case, with a total score that approaches to zero, with maximum three, this startup is more confident to join an investing accelerator. Upon joining a program, a startup will encounter a lot of mentors, coaches, or advisors who will lead the startup towards the completion of its goal. But what is the difference between a mentor, a coach, or advisor? Well, unfortunately, there is a lot of confusion about those terms as they are used or abused by many programs. Depending on the program, though, a coach or a mentor usually provide more frequent services to startups while advisors are less frequent, less engaged, so they are called to supplement the program coaches with their industry expertise. So both mentors or advisors and coaches work in supplementary way. So it is critical for the program also to adopt the right term and use them in a way that the startup will understand the difference before applying. After clearing the air of who is a mentor, an advisor, or a coach, it's important for the startup organizers to understand and define the level and rules of engagement. So startup mentors, advisors, and coaches should have clear job descriptions and rules of engagement. So the depth, the type of engagement, as well the way those operate with each other to support the startup needs, needs to be clearly defined. A program, a schedule of how the synthesis will work can be employed and can help the startup organizers. The way the program coaches or mentors and advisors work hand in hand in daily weekly consulting, providing lectures or masterclasses or provide professional advice can determine and profile the program per se and affect the cost as well as the structure of the program. Here we can see five different ways where advisors and coaches work together in order to provide services for the program startups. Since not projects are the same, despite the many common denominators that mentors identify among startups, it's the responsibility of the program organizers to screen all those projects early during the application period and identify the applicant's project parameters 
This is important as to predict the resources needed and the compatibility of the program to support its applicant. It's also important to identify the accelerated startup needs, what they will need on the way while being accelerated, and of course select the right mentoring approach for the job, and of course with the right synthesis of advisors and mentors as we suggest.